good. So we are now on uh, page 31 of notes number um, 17. And we're going to get into the nitty gritty. We've had a lot of introduction here. And uh, there's uh, uh, lots more equations to come. So it's time to uh, get a move on. Um, so I wanted to um, introduce the acoustic scalar wave equation for two dimensions, which is how we will accomplish the downward continuation that we, we need to do. Uh, basically, it's uh, d squared p uh, dz squared plus d squared p dx squared minus 1 over v squared d squared p dx squared. I mean, sorry, dt squared. So that's what this notation means. And um, you can see that there's no y coordinate here. Uh, you can see that um, uh, we're probably going to be talking about a constant velocity uh, being most valid with this particular equation. P is the pressure field in space and time in x, y, I'm sorry, x, z, and t. Uh, it's three dimensional, including time. And um, that's, uh, that's what we're going to develop now into our uh, downward continuation method. Um, now let's, uh, uh, you know, how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to come back to our old friend, the Fourier transform. And now uh, everything we're doing here is basically going to involve two-dimensional Fourier transforms. And so I want to put out the definitions. Um, and uh, uh, the, you've, you've seen these definitions before. Uh, but now you know it's going to be explicit exactly what we're doing, and unlike the first half of the class, in this half of the class, you can see that Clairbout has included the uh, scale factor one over two pi for the continuous transform on both the forward and the uh, the inverse. Okay, and it's one over two pi because there's a trans there's you know there's two integrals here. You know, if there was just one transform in one direction, then it would be uh, one over the square root of the quantity two pi. Okay, so uh, we get a one over two pi, um, and uh, we'll have to figure out what that scale factor is going to be for the uh, uh, the eventual discrete two D Fourier transform that we'll that we'll be grappling with. Um, <clears throat> it's also important to note that. Uh, the, uh, in these Euler exponentials that uh, are the Fourier exponentials, you know, these really bring in, you know, uh, if you think in terms of the Fourier being one example of a wavelet transform, you know, where do you get the wavelet that we use here? Well, you get to get it from e to the i omega t and, and minus uh, e to the minus i k, k sub x times x. Okay, um, and on the inverse, it's uh, uh, we take the uh, the inverse of the uh, of the exponent, or the we take the uh, uh, the negative of the exponent, the inverse of the exponential. Um, and you'll note that the uh, the spatial um, when we look at the three D uh, 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 Fourier transform, uh, you'll see that the spatial terms, the spatial exponents, all have the same sign. And it's always in opposition to the sign of the time exponent, okay? And the same on the uh, on the inverse. All right. So there's our our definition. Uh, just watch out. It's maybe not entirely clear in my notes. Um, you know how I've written them. This is k sub x here, k d k sub x there, uh, k sub x in the exponentials, okay? But times x, right? Uh, so I hope that's not too too confusing. Now here are these uh, useful Fourier uh, derivative uh, theorems, which now we can uh, develop for both uh, uh, ddx and ddt, and and then extend them to d squared, <coughs> dx squared, and d squared d, dt squared. All right. So whatever function, you know, f of x and t, right? We do a 2D Fourier transform, and we have f of k sub x and omega in the Fourier domain. And the double arrow here is not an equal sign. It means the Fourier dual. 
Uh, but we're going to actually treat it like an equal sign, and we're going to Fourier transform equations. You're going to do a lot of this in, in uh, labs uh, six and seven. You're going to actually Fourier transform whole equations just by substituting in the, um, <coughs> uh, the Fourier dual. Okay? And you'll use other theorems besides the derivative theorems. Um, but this is uh, just how the derivative theorems work. Um, so if you take the, um, you know, maybe this this F is our two D pressure field. If you take the x derivative of it, then in the Fourier domain, that's the same as uh, taking the Fourier transform of the pressure field in two dimensions and uh, multiplying it by the complex number i times k sub x. And for the time derivative, the Fourier dual is multiplication by minus i omega. The Fourier dual of um, of the the uh, second derivative in x is multiplication by minus k sub x squared, and the Fourier dual of the second time derivative is the um, uh, multiplication by minus omega squared. Okay, you can see how that works. It's just you know squaring minus i omega, right? Um, and uh, so later on, you'll you'll even uh, have to factor these out uh, because once you've uh, you know, if you can factor out a minus kx squared, you know, out of your uh, out of whatever equation you're working with, out of whatever process you're trying to do, then you know that that has a Fourier dual with um, with the uh, um, <coughs> um, the second x derivative. Okay, uh, and re also remember the symmetry. Okay, if you differentiate by say omega, okay. Uh, in the Fourier domain, then that's the same as multiplying by um, by x in the in the spatial domain. Okay, so there there's a, a very nice symmetry here. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and and apply these to the scalar acoustic wave equation, which is you know going to be adequate for this class uh, at least in terms of defining everything everything about wave propagation that uh, uh, that we'll need to deal with, okay, uh, and strictly only true for a fluid, so it's especially good for marine surveys. All right, so we'll factor out the uh, the wave field. Now, notice here this is a small p, okay, because it's in, and you got to look at the arguments in the it's in the x, z, and t domain, so that's the pressure field in the x, z, and t domain, and we operate on it with this compound operator here, which is the uh, the Second z derivative, the second x derivative, uh, and then minus uh, minus one over v squared times the uh, second time derivative. So we simply transform by substituting in the Fourier duals. Okay, uh, but I'm only going to um, let's see. I'm going to leave it in z. Okay, remember I'm after downward continuation here, so I want to leave I want to leave the z derivative because I want to know how do I how do I take my my wave field p from from uh, depth zero to maybe depth one meter? Okay, so I want to know what the z derivative is. Okay, of the wave field, and so that's what we're actually going to try to calculate here. So I, I won't transform to uh, to k sub z. I'm going to transform from x to k sub x. I'm going to transform from time to omega. Okay, and you can see that. I've I've represented those in the arguments. So now there's this bizarre mixed object, right? And um, uh, it's been trans the wave field's been transformed from x to kx and from time to omega, but it has not been transformed from from uh, z to uh, uh, to kz. It's still in z. And that's the wonderful thing about these partial derivatives, right? And we don't have any compound. Derivatives here, so we don't have one derivative buried in another one, and so everything is really very nicely linear in that way. All right, we we it's our choice. I, I could have just as well uh, transformed from from z to kz and left x alone, or I could have left time alone. It doesn't matter. Okay, but this will be a convenient form. So now what have I got? I've got d squared p dz squared. Okay, is equal to. Uh, Minus omega squared over v squared minus k 
x squared, OK, uh, k sub x squared. So this is just a, uh, uh, a number, right? kx, the, uh, it's a real number. Omega is a real number. Uh, so we just have some real numbers multiplied by the wave field. All right. Um, there, is, there aren't even any complex numbers here. <clears throat> and, and this derivative, well, we got the second derivative. We don't have the first derivative yet, but we got the second derivative. That's the information we need for the downward continuation. So now we see if we if we can transform our data, you know, at z equals zero to um, uh, to kx and omega, and then we just multiply by these numbers, right? And as we loop through our data set, you know, we know what you know which omega we're on. We know which kx we're on. We got to assume a velocity. That's the most troublesome part. You know, then we can actually calculate this derivative in the Fourier domain. Very easy. Don't have to do any any uh, finite differences or anything else at all. Okay. So this this equation here is a is I, I hope you recognize it as a second order ordinary differential equation, right? We've got a uh, the only derivative in here is on on p, uh, and it's second order in z. Right, this is just multiplication. Even though we know that derivatives are buried in here, it's just multiplication by uh, by a number. Right, no big deal. So it looks like this. It looks like uh, 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 second derivative of p, d, p double prime, plus some some numerical constant a a naught. Right, so a naught is going to absorb all that times uh, uh, times the uh, uh, the the uh, the wave field undifferentiated is equal to zero, okay, and so there's a definition of of a naught, and uh, so the characteristic equation of this right is uh, lambda squared uh, plus a naught is equal to zero, and it has uh, some it has two roots of course it's a second order equation, and so uh, one root is lambda one, the other is lambda two. Uh, and it, they're basically plus or minus. They they are imaginary, as you can see, um, plus or minus um, uh, i times the square root of a naught. Okay, so then we have the solution, right? This this we can create the solution, which will then solve the first, the second order ordinary differential equation. We have some initial pressure field p zero. Okay, and. Uh, we multiply it by the uh, the solution, you know, we, and we use a uh, an imaginary exponential, right? So we, we can solve it with one of these Fourier exponentials, right? This involves sines and cosines, plus or minus i times the square root of a naught times z, okay? And uh, uh, and that's going to give us the uh, the wave field. Okay, so now let me let me, you know, it's it's an initial value problem in z, right? And um, so writing out the whole solution with all the variables that, that we just developed, you know, for our wave field, right? Our initial, our initial, um, uh, our initial uh, data uh, are the wave field at z equals zero, okay? And we have uh, uh, we've been we Fourier transformed it from x and time, right? So our 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 two dimensional Zero offset data set is in x and t, right? And uh, and we Fourier transform it in two dimensions to kx and omega. So that's our initial data. We multiply it by uh, e to the plus or minus i times z. Okay, z is the depth we want, right? We're going to get a two D wave field at whatever constant depth z that we put into there. All right. So that's going to be downward continued data. How about that? That's what we want, and um, and then z is multiplied by this uh, square root of the quantity omega squared over v squared minus kx squared. Okay, so all we have to do now, right, is we take this p, this downward continued data, it's still in the kx and omega domain, and we um, uh, and all we have to do is uh, and 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 we get that by taking the Fourier transformed two D Fourier transformed uh, zero offset data. We multiply it by this this uh, bizarre um, this bizarre uh, uh, exponential here. It's still an imaginary exponential, and then we just do a two D inverse Fourier transform from um, from k x and omega back to x and t. Right. It's all done at a constant level z. Right. 
this you know this inverse Fourier tra this two D inverse Fourier transform will accomplish you know will get us one Z level. Okay, you'll downward continue our whole data to one Z level. All right, and and you know these other exponentials out here, those are just the uh, the inverse Fourier transform exponentials. You know from from kx to x and from omega to t. That's all they are, and we're integrating over all kx and all all omega. That's just the inverse Fourier transform wrapped around it there. So what is this bizarre thing uh, that we've got as a new Euler imaginary ex exponent? Okay, uh, this this has a very uh, important name. It's called the dispersion relation, um, and it's uh, it's only related conceptually to um, the dispersion curves that you may have heard about for surface waves. All right, uh, but it is the same concept. It 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 defines the path that a wave takes through uh, velocity and frequency space, or, or here, as we're expressing it, through um, spatial frequency and time frequency. Okay? So it's, it's, it's saying that, the, uh, uh, that this, this phenomenon we're observing, some kind of wave, has a particular path through that kx and omega space. So we can. That's that's uh, conceptually exactly the same thing as um, uh, as surface wave dispersion. Okay, so this is a, a dispersion relation. All right, and uh, you know it's going to help us answer the question: Which of the conjugate roots do we use in the solution? Right. I mean, I've got downward continued data here, but I got to know: Do I use the plus or the minus uh, exponent on the um, on this, I actually I can't use both. Okay, got to use. Gotta, I got to pick one. Okay, and and it's going to turn out the the choice of plus or minus is going to affect how the wave field will propagate, and and thus uh, it depends on what our model for imaging is. You know, what, how did our data come about, and how are we projecting our data into a uh, into a model, into an image. So uh, all right, let's take this partially transformed wave equation. Right, it's uh, uh, it's still in z. Right, we still got a z derivative here, and it's the wave field in kx and z in omega. And let's finish the job. Let's tr let's go ahead and transform it over z. Same thing. We've got minus kx squared minus I'm sorry minus kz squared minus kx squared plus omega squared over v squared times the wave field. Now 3D Fourier transformed in kx, kz, and omega. Okay. Now, now that equals zero, right? So we can divide out p. Let's let's get rid of the wave field. Okay. The wave field could be anything, right? So let's divide out p and uh, and look at what we got left. What we got left is the is the, is called the dispersion relation. All right. Well worth uh, memorizing. Okay. Kx squared plus kz squared is equal to omega squared over v squared. So I think it should be clear that this is the equation of a circle in the kx kz plane. Okay. Now we we played around a lot earlier this semester with unit circles in the complex z plane, right? Um, and this is uh, this is not that, but it's another circle, right? Uh, uh, this is why um, practically everything I do. You know, essentially boils down to trigonometry, because I keep having, I keep finding these circles in everything I'm doing. Okay, these circular relations. I mean, now we're we're in this bizarre Fourier transform domain, kx and kz. Uh, we're not in the z plane, and I'm still, you know, everything's based on a circle. All right, and um, the circle has uh, has a radius, omega over v. Okay, and and so um, you know, if you take if you take a uh, a wave field and you have it, you know, you, you have it all all uh, uh, downward continued. Okay, so you know the, how the wave field varies in z. You know how the wave field varies in x, right? Um, if you take that wave field and you transform it from x and z to kx and uh, and kz, then it's actually going to land on this circle, okay? 
in this plane. You know, the, the plane could be, uh, I mean, of course, you'll transform noise, there'll be artifacts of the Fourier transform, all that. You know, there's going to be amplitude all through this plane once you, you know, especially if you Fourier transform real data. You know, there's all kinds of things that don't obey this uh, acoustic wave equation, right? But uh, uh, what does obey the acoustic wave equation, that energy is going to land on this circle. And that circle is defined, you know, right here. Okay? So, uh, uh, you know, any, any acoustic constant velocity wave field is going to satisfy that dispersion relation. And that's how, you know, here in the Fourier domain, we can distinguish a wave field from some other function. You know, maybe surface waves, they, they, won't, they won't land on the circle. Uh, S waves will make their own circles. Uh, variations in velocity will distort the circle, okay, and smear it out at least. Um, uh, but the circle does uh, does one more thing for us, okay? If uh, if we have right radius omega over v, if we uh, uh, suppose we we had a full data set, we had all you know we had it recorded at all levels, okay? We had it recorded at all x, we had it recorded at all time, and we just transform that data set. It's a three D data set, right? And we just transform it to a three D Fourier domain data set. We we have it at uh, at a, you know for all omega, all kx, and all kz. All right. Then we could observe where the where the circles are falling, and we could then calculate. We could estimate the velocity. All right. Uh, now um, we're assuming that step's done, and we know what the velocity is. Okay. I mean, really, I don't talk a lot more about determining velocity. I talk a lot about determining velocity in in um, uh, in in 692, okay, in applied geophysics, you know how we practically, as a practical matter, we measure velocity. I talk a lot about how we, you know, how we can tomographically determine velocity in um, in 757. All right, um, but here, you know, in this class, we're we're going to accept the velocity we're given. You know, we we've we've done some work. We have a velocity, and we're going to we're going to run with it. All right. So we know what the velocity is, okay? And let's say that we have our our zero offset data in in t and x, okay? Time and and x. So we transform it to uh, to kx and omega, okay? Uh, then because this obeys this circular relationship, all right? Because it holds the dispersion curve. We can find out where on the kz axis this intersects, and we can get kz, right? We can get the shape of the circle, you know, gives us kz. So, you know, we um, we have uh, since v is uh, the velocity is a given, we have omega, we have kx, we have kz. If we have any two, we can get the third. Okay, and our data is going to give us kx and omega, and we want to get kz for downward continuation. So we have two, we get the third. That's the power of the dispersion uh, relation. Okay. Uh, likewise, if for some reason, like let's say we're doing a, a, a we've done a vertical seismic profile, so we would have kz, we would have omega, but we don't have kx. But we have two, we can get the third. We can get k, we can get kx. Okay. Um, all right. Now for this question of of the sign on that on that thing. I, I hope you recognize this is um, uh, this is that exponential we saw in the uh, downward continuation. Okay, and I think you can see that that is the solution of the um, of the dispersion relation for kz. Right, you you take this version relation, you solve it for kz, and you get this um, this radical here, which is in the exponent. So that's really z times kz, right? So there's z times there's there's kz again, okay? And we have plus or minus uh, e to the uh, power of plus or minus i times z times kz, which is this square root of the quantity omega squared over v squared minus kx squared, okay? Now, 
the sign we choose there is going to is going to affect whether our wave field propagates up or down. All right. So let's take the positive kz. All right. And um, so that means we're taking the upper half circle. Okay. So uh, you know we don't, we're not allowing a negative kz. Okay. So we're using uh, v and omega and kx. We're calculating a kz, and it's going to be we're going to select the positive one. So we only got the upper half circle. What this means in the physical domain is that uh, you know as the wave is propagating, z is increasing as time is increasing. Okay. That's for an exploding, uh, uh, a, an expanding wave. Okay. Uh, if we have an imploding wave, a, a collapsing wave, right? We would have z decreasing as time increases. Okay, so that's you know that's what's going to happen with positive kz. All right. Uh, now, what if we have negative kz? Okay, kz is negative, right? That means we're using the the uh, the lower half, uh, the negative part of the semi of the circle, the negative semicircle. That's going to mean that z increases as time decreases, and that's but that's for an imploding wave. For an exploding wave, that means that z is decreasing as time increase is increasing. Okay, for negative kz. Okay, now let's consider two point sources. All right, here's our seismic array on the ground along the x-axis. Okay, and um, uh, each of these sources is the source of an expanding, exploding wave, right? So uh, we put it at positive z, okay, and we let z decrease as time increases. That means the wave is propagating up, okay, from from a point at depth to our array. Uh, the other way, okay, if uh, if the wave is propagating down. If z is increasing as time increases, okay, then our source has to be up in the air, above our seismic array, okay, and propagating down. So our data at z equals zero, you know, you know, since velocity is constant everywhere, right? I don't have a free service interface. You know, I'm not allowed that. I, I've got constant velocity, okay. So so since velocity is constant. The data are identical for both cases, and our choice of sign then is going to be a choice of where we think the sources are. Okay. Well, I, I hope it's obvious. Since we're using the exploding reflector model, the the reflectors are the sources, and the sources are below the receivers at z greater than zero. You know, we we don't have reflectors up in the air above the receivers. Okay. Um, I've actually put sources up in the air, but uh, uh, you know, aside from making a huge noise, uh, you know, this theory won't cover that. <laughs> um, so, so since our sources are below the receivers, we're going to pick the left-hand side, and that means we want upgoing waves with kz having a minus sign. So now we know which one to pick. Okay, here's the downward continuation operator that we can actually use. All right, and I'm going to teach you practically how to use it. Um, we take the surface data at z equals zero. We pick a z level that we want to downward continue it to, and we multiply by e to the now minus i times z um, times the times kz, which is the square root of the quantity omega squared over v squared minus kx squared. Okay, there's a dispersion relation right there, and then we take the the p of kx. And z and at this constant z and omega, and we do a 2D inverse Fourier transform, and that gives us the 2D data field uh, at all x and all t, but at that one level z. So there's you know <clears throat> there's not much here to tell you that 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 z is a constant in this, right? But that's uh, that's the case. Notice there's no integration over z here. So uh, it can be a constant. So the assumptions in this downward continuation are um, zero offset data, exploding reflectors. We can manipulate this. I mean, right now we've we've used uh, 
you know, constant velocity, you know, only one v everywhere. We will be able to manipulate it to uh, have an acceptable solution for velocity varying as a, as a function of depth only. Okay, so you know, we could put a, a realistic well log uh, velocity into this, but no lateral variation. And also, it's acoustic. Okay, there's only one velocity. There's no there's no shear waves. <clears throat> Although you could, uh, you know, the uh, the acoustic wave equation is exactly the same as the scalar, uh, the 2D scalar wave equation for SH waves. So you could actually use this to handle uh, 2D SH wave data. Okay, if because uh, uh, it, it, it's they come from the same wave equation, so you could migrate. SH wave data, and actually, um, some of my colleagues, particularly in Indiana, the Indiana Geological Survey, um, they've done they've done some amazing things with uh, SH wave surveys and and migration. You know, they can actually get. Uh, turns out that in the in the soil, um, uh, shear velocity varies much less laterally than p velocity. So you can you can you your SH wave surveys are much higher quality and much easier to analyze. <laughs> quite a quite a discovery. I wouldn't have suspected, but it but now it makes sense. It's because um, in the soil the, the big thing that varies in most places is the uh, soil moisture, and and the uh, you know where the water table uh, uh, where you go into the water table you go into full saturation. You know the p velocity can triple, quadruple, okay, but the uh, the s velocity doesn't change much across the water table, and uh, you know and, and it doesn't change hardly at all with uh, variations in soil moisture. So it's uh, it's uh, it's it's it makes sense, but quite an amazing discovery about ten years ago. Okay, so um, um, let's. Uh, Let's talk about downward continuation as a um, as a process, as a um, and, and, and you know tied in with the concepts we had in the first part of the class as a filter. It's a two D filter, but it's still a filter. It's just not a one D filter. Um, as a as an operator, as a uh, transform. Okay, it's it's just another kind of transform. Um, so here's the uh, downward continuation uh, uh, relation. And it's, it's really just a multiplication of the wave field in the kx and omega domain. So you know, if it's a, a multiplication in, 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 uh, uh, in kx, then you know, before the Fourier transform, it was a convolution, right? So uh, uh, it's very much like the Fourier domain filters that we, that we had looked at. You know where you convolve in the uh, time and space domain, and you, uh, or you multiply in the Fourier domain. This is the same thing. Okay, you take surface data. You know here uh, uh, physical domain, and here in Fourier domain, and you uh, convolve it with some filter, which we haven't we haven't expressed that, but uh, we know what it is in the Fourier domain, and you get you get the downward continued data in either the physical or the Fourier domain. So uh, thinking about it, in, you know, in simpler one D terms, you know, we've got we've got uh, uh, input, an input, we've got an output, which is downward continued data, and the filter, you know, he is here expressed as this multiplication. You can see it's a multiplication by a complex number in the in the Fourier domain, right? Um, e to the i times z times k z, uh, and and now we're you know I I didn't put the minus sign in here. Uh, but we're going to be using uh, the minus sign. Since we have a filter, you know, it's a linear transformation, and we need to ask, okay, what's the impulse response? And it's it's very simply, it's just uh, x squared plus z squared is equal to uh, v squared t squared. And uh, I might still have you derive this in um, in the uh, in lab six, um, so I don't give you the I don't give you the whole derivation here of what this impulse response is, but uh, I, I think there's an exercise in lab six that leads you to that. Uh, so this is this is that cone. It's the form of a semicircular wave. Well, actually, what I've written here is a circular wave, but 
if we're just going to take the negative uh, kz part, it's going to be a semicircular wave traveling from the origin at a constant velocity v. That is the um, that is the uh, uh, the impulse response of downward continuation. Okay, and that makes sense, right? Because we're we're spreading that wave field from every exploding reflecting point. So you know, given this is an impulse response, if we add up many impulse responses, you know, we can we can produce any desired wave field. Uh, and since our uh, uh, our e to the i times uh, z times uh, kz, right? There's the dispersion relation. Since that filter is of, of the form, uh, it's 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 an imaginary exponent, right? E, it's of this form e to the i phi. Okay, I think you can see that uh, after the first part of this class, this is just an all-pass phase shifting filter, right? This is this is moving the wave field around. It's moving the timing around. It's moving the phase. But it's not really changing the amplitude, right? Uh, you know the uh, uh, what's the uh, what's the magnitude of e to the i uh, e to the i phi is just one, right? Um, so um, because you've got the sine of uh, you, you're adding the cosine of, uh, of of phi to the sine of phi, and so so the magnitude is always one. That therefore, this is an all-pass filter. Isn't that amazing? Our, our you know, wave, wave propagation is really nothing more than, than, a, uh, uh, than a very simple all-pass filter in two dimensions. Okay? And, and that's what we want, right? We don't want, we don't want the filter to be adding energy. Now, yeah, we should be subtracting energy you know, we should be losing energy out the size of the survey box. We should be losing energy to intrinsic attenuation and maybe to scattering. Okay, um, but uh, you know that's not represented in, in the the simple acoustic wave equation that we that we came up with. So uh, you know this is exactly what we want now. You know, a very smooth two D all pass filter. Now. Um, let me go to uh, notes 18, and uh, I can do a little bit of illustration of this. All right, here's that that cone, you know, which is now we know it's the impulse response in in XTZ of um, of the uh, uh, of downward continuation as a as a filter. Okay, so we're just back to those Huygens wave front and the exploding spot, and cutting it in different directions is giving us, you know, either a, a hyperbolic shape or a circular shape. Okay, so uh, that's all. That's all there is to it. All right, I've got ten minutes here to launch into two uh, D Fourier transforms. Right, we we got the whole, you know, we got the whole. Um, uh, We've got the whole downward continuation problem wired. You know, we can do it. We can accomplish those examples that I showed you earlier. You know, where I downward continued a synthetic wave field and showed you that I can reconstruct the model, the the structures. Okay, from the and collapse all the uh, diffraction hyperbolas. Okay, that's what we want to do. Um, but there's some some practical considerations. Okay, um, and and. Uh, it comes in this essential first step of putting the 2D data into the uh, uh, into the Fourier domain, doing the 2D Fourier transform. How do we do a 2D Fourier transform? Okay, I did. You know, I skipped over the uh, the uh, uh, the page on that in the first part of the class, and um, and we're going to get to it here. All right, our. Um, so that that two D wave equation, that two D Fourier transform is critical, is critical, and you know for a lot of our data sets, it's pretty easy to do. Okay, once you know, I'll show you, I'll show you how to do it right. Okay, and and you could set up a very simple code that would that would do it right, and it would work for most uh, most sections. But when you get to three D data, or even you get to two D data as extensive as uh, Amy Isis's uh, chirp surveys or Gretchen's. Chirp surveys, okay, from Lake Tahoe, and I Isis's were from Pyramid Lake, okay. Those have hundreds of thousands of traces, 
and each trace is you know has uh, uh, maybe ten thousand data points. Okay, so we're going to run, run into some problems with data sizes. All right, and uh, so I, I need to explain to you not only how to do a two D Fourier transform correctly, but also uh, how to do it fast in the case of of you know how, how to not have it bogged down. Okay, and that's uh, so the, the essential uh, part of that, the essential insight, uh, no, the solution to the essential insight is essentially is basically a card trick, and that card trick is something that I will do uh, for you uh, the next time we meet, which is going to be Tuesday the thirteenth, I think it is. Um, so hopefully I'll remember to bring um, to bring a deck of cards. Um, it's you know it's a it's a very nicely Nevada solution, right? <laughs> uh, but it's really just a very simple card trick. Uh, but it's il illustrative of of you know a very important uh, solution in computational science as well. Okay, so um, we have the the two D F uh, Fourier transform. Okay. Uh, here written in continuous form, you know, we're transforming a fu some function like our service uh, 2D uh, zero offset data from x and t to kx and omega. All right. Now, of course, uh, we're going to drop the one over two pi scale factor. Okay, we're going to drop the infinite limits. Um, when we go to the uh, the discrete Fourier transform, you know, these change anyway, and so. You know, we're not going to let those get in our way. We we have to figure out later how to uh, have the appropriate scale factors. Okay. Uh, the other thing here is I can't just assign small letters to functions in the physical domain and capitals to their Fourier duals in the in the Fourier domain. Okay, because we've got you know all these mixed objects we've looked at like capital P of omega kx, but z. Okay, still in the physical domain. So you know whatever whatever whether I do a small letter or a, or a, or a capital letter for the 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 multidimensional field, you got to look at the arguments. Okay, so I'm going to try to keep the arguments in here so that you can always see you know what's been done to it. Okay, for the sign convention, uh, as I've said before, we're choosing the convention of physicists, which is the opposite to that of electrical engineers. Okay, electrical engineers have the sign of the spatial transform. Be the same as the sign of the tra time transform because they're worried about waves collapsing onto antennas, um, and uh, and that's that's kind of their prototype problem. We're worried about waves, you know, uh, coming out from explosions. Okay, so we need we need that uh, uh, we need to uh, uh, fix that sign convention. Um, so our waves are, are going to propagate positively on any spatial axis as as time uh, goes as time increases. Okay, our reflectors explode, and so that we are going to require the sign on the spatial frequencies, however many we have, to be opposite the sign on the temporal frequency. We only have one time axis, right? Uh, at least I hope. Even even superstring theory, right? It it has sixteen or twenty three spatial dimensions, but only one time dimension. So. At least we we have that sim sim simplicity, okay. Um, so we'll let the time axis have the positive sign in the forward Fourier transform, and then here's the the uh, signs. Here's the exponentials, the Fourier exponentials for the the spatial axes, and on the inverse Fourier transform, we'll let the the time axis take the negative Fourier transform. Of course, electrical engineers write Fourier transform. Software and they design processors that do Fourier transforms. So, you know, we may have to take the complex conjugate of the of the Fourier transform data. Okay. Now, in most in most software, the electrical engineers write they allow that. You know, you you tell them whether whether you want this done with a positive or negative sign. Okay. But sometimes not, um, and so we got to watch it. Okay. The factors under the integrals are all separable. Okay, so here's our, our 2D Fourier transform. Note, we can do the Fourier transform from time to omega, from time to frequency first. We can do that whole Fourier transform. We can 
we can uh, write it out to a uh, uh, to a CD and and mail it to our friend in uh, uh, in, in uh, Dubai, and and he can he can do the transform from x to kx, you know, the next month. Okay, totally separable. All right, and and you could see that here in the uh, in the uh, in the just in the algebra. Okay, so what's in the square brackets here? Okay, is the Fourier the partially Fourier transform data? Uh, it's still in x, but it's it's been transformed from in one dimension only from time to omega. Okay, and then we need to finish the job, and also we can we can do it the other way around. Okay. We can transform it from x to kx, you know, put it put it in a drawer, come back uh, next year and and finish transforming it uh, from uh, time to omega. Okay, it doesn't matter which way we do; we will get this exactly algebraically the same result. It's not an approximation. Okay. Um, let's see now. Uh, Note that uh, uh, each directional transform, you know, from from t to omega or from kx to x, from x to kx, is just a one-dimensional Fourier transform in different directions over the two D function. All right. So here, uh, uh, and and maybe this is a little weird because I'm I'm going to plot this with time going to the right. So maybe this will make more sense to the earthquake seismologists. And then x is going to go down. Okay, so here's our original our original data, which we'll just consider a matrix. Okay, so let's just say, all right, first we're going to Fourier transform um, from time to omega, right? And time is the is is varying along the rows of this matrix. Okay, this is a you know two D matrix in the in the computer, and so the you know we we take every time row, right, and we Fourier transform that. Okay, and then to finish the job, to Fourier transform from x to kx, we take every column, you know, which is how x varies, and we Fourier transform those. So if I have, you know, here, uh, uh, if I have a thousand uh, seismograms, right? Each seismogram is is one of these rows of time. Then I I'm doing a thousand one D Fourier transforms. If I have ten thousand um, uh, time points, right? Then each of these columns, I'm going to have ten thousand columns that vary in x. Okay, and and I'm going to have to transform each of those. You know, I'm going to make I'm going to do ten thousand uh, trans uh, uh, one dimensional transforms from x to kx. Okay, so I think this is where I'll uh, I'll leave it here. Um, you know, uh, basically, uh, if you have n t times n x, the number of Fourier tr of one d Fourier transform calls, you know, subroutine calls, say required, right, is going to be um, is going to be first to go from time to to uh, to omega. You got to have n x number of Fourier transforms run, right. And then to go from x to kx, you got to have n t number of, of Fourier transforms run on n t columns. Okay, so that's how it is going to kind of stack together. Okay.